Hello, and welcome to the Intro to RedCap tutorial. This Intro to RedCap tutorial is based on the basics of RedCap. Uh, this course is meant for anyone who has either never seen RedCap before or has very little experience with it and wants to get to use the tool in their day-to-day -day life, uh, or work environment, I should say. This course is going to answer a couple of questions that are seen on the screen here. So our first section is, what is RedCap? Uh, step two says, show me what it does. Uh, step three says, how do I make a survey myself? And how do we use branching logic? And then how do I enter data? So these are five of the very key pieces of REDCap, and we'll be discussing these today. Uh, additional items will be covered in future courses. Um, so with that being said, let's jump in. So first of all, uh, what is REDCap? Uh, REDCap is a data collection tool. It's an abbreviation. It stands for uh, Research Electronic Data capture. So we have our RED and there's our CAP. Uh, so it is a tool primarily based for research studies uh, that tracks patient data over a duration of time or just for any kind of research needs. Uh, just because it is has the word research in the title doesn't only mean it's used for research. You can also find operational purposes for REDCap as well. Uh, it's a great tool that uses surveys. Uh, we'll be talking about surveys in a future course there. Um, but you'll see how online forms are built. So it's any kind of electronic data form or data capture as we see there. But we have had operational uses in the past. We've actually had groups uh, that have used REDCap for things as simple as having a uh, uh, online survey that asks, when do you want to get lunch next week? Um, and then people in their team will fill it out. We've also had uh, people use it as an anonymous suggestion box where you can have a uh, form or you can create a form with a QR code and have that posted somewhere and then people can come and use it uh, just to give their feedback about their department or something like that. Uh, but the main use is primarily for research. We will be tracking patients in there um, and tracking them over a period of time. The nice thing with REDCap is that you'll be able to create forms that have any kind of data collection in there. Uh, you can create them from scratch, collect pretty much any kind of question that you want. Uh, there is no other kind of requirements to it. So with that being said, that's a really brief overview. I don't want to spend uh, too much time on that. Next question is, or the next point that we're talking about is show me what it does. And I have that here uh, for us to take a look at. So I have this sample project here, and I'm currently in the menu that says uh, record status dashboard. Let me see if I can just increase that size a little bit there. So there we go, that's pretty good. So I'm in this menu here on the left-hand side, and I know you're looking at a lot right now, but we're gonna be talking about it. Um, and hopefully by the end of this class, you'll be pretty familiar with uh, what at least some of these uh, are, or what you're at least working with right now. So under the record status dashboard, uh, what I have here is a list of all of my current patients or any patients that I've recorded data for. So I have seven patients right here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, and then I have all of the forms associated with each of those patients. So I have their patient information, some visit information, some follow-up information, a one month out follow-up, and then information on their COVID vaccines. Um, and you can see by the color codes here is that you can see which forms are filled out and which forms are still missing by these gray ones here. And there's a few other colors here like the red and yellow and we can talk about those later, but don't worry about the colors. Um, they really have no impact on the data whatsoever. They are just kind of markers to remind maybe people on the team on what needs to be addressed or what doesn't need to be addressed, but it doesn't really matter in terms of what the colors actually are. All the data will be uh, collected just the same. Uh, from this view here, you can review information. So let's say I'm interested in patient number two and I want to see uh, their patient information. So I can click on that bubble and that will bring up uh, a patient record. So this is a form that you're looking at here. Uh, and this form is created from scratch. So built completely custom to the needs of the study. Now in this case here, of course, this is just a sample study. So nothing serious is going to be collected here. But uh, we have our patient Lisa Sampson. Um, and then we've collected date of birth, sex, uh, email address, state of residence, cell phone number, home address, emergency contact information, and it provides a signature at the bottom here, so a place where they uh, can sign. Uh, and this is all a fully, like once we said before, a fully custom built form. If I go back to my dashboard here on the left hand side, I get brought back to where I was and I can see all of my patients again. Let's say I'm still interested in patient number two and then we want to get some of their visit information. And I can click on this form here and that will open up their second form. Once again, this is a completely built from scratch form to tailored to my specific needs as I wanted them to be. And for this form, we have basic information such as the date of visit, the reason for visit, who is the visit provider, and some vitals here of weight, height, 
blood pressure, heart rate, and cholesterol. Uh, and that's everything that we've collected for that one. And then once again, I can return to my record status dashboard and let's stick with patient number two here and check out their one week follow up. Um, we just want to see this was the follow up. Um, and we see here that the patient would like another prescription of painkillers. Great. Uh, so what, this is a very simple form. And once again, built completely from scratch. And so you can see this is how REDCap tracks data uh, in this kind of tabular format. So if I was interested in patient number four, and let's say the patient number four came in for their one week follow up visit, and I can click on this blank uh, bubble right here and fill out some information for them. So let's say they uh, followed up with their information. Um, let's say it was on July 1st, and we added some notes in here that says, uh, patient is feeling well after the procedure. Very simple like that. And then we have the ability here to mark it as either incomplete, unverified, or complete. Um, and that just determines the color of the bubble that we talked about before. Once again, this option has no impact whatsoever on your data. It just changes the color um, for that particular bubble. Uh, just to touch on those colors a little bit more, um, our team will often use the colors to represent something that needs attention. So we will often mark things that uh, are either yellow or red as just being something that, hey, someone needs to check this out and just either look at that information or do any kind of other review on it. But once again, do not stress about the colors. Um, <laughs> it's not the, uh, not the end of the world there if they're a little bit traffic lighty <laughs> and changing all the time. So that's okay. Um, so hopefully that gives a little good of a, a little bit of a picture on um, what REDCap is capable of doing and what it's built for is to make these forms and collect data uh, for your particular study. And in this case here, I have six forms, but we're going to go over and make a, a project from scratch that has just maybe three forms in it. So it won't be as wide as this one, but hopefully will give us a little bit of uh, practice and show you how that process of creating forms happens. So by doing that, um, Let's go here. Uh, so this is the main login page of REDCap. So we're now just, as we've just logged into our REDCap environment, um, and it's brought us here to this main page. On the top of the screen, you see a bunch of navigation options. So you see the My Projects button, a New Projects button, and a few others here. Uh, for today, we're gonna be talking about creating a project from scratch, from absolute brand new, as if nothing uh, was started for us. And I'm going to do that by clicking where it says new project. So we'll start from there. So selecting new project, I'm now ready to make my project from scratch and I'll call uh, it a project title. So let's say uh, we'll do, we'll do uh, intro to REDCap practice forms. Great. And then the purpose of the project, you would select what you're using it for. Uh, today's purpose is just for practice, but if it's for operational use, select that. If it's for research, select that. If it's for quality improvement, select that. Um, if you just plan to play around, great, use practice and just for fun. But if you do intend to use the project uh, for real data collection, just use anything else besides practice and just for fun, because at our environment, we do go through the practice ones that are marked as practice, and we do delete those regularly. Um, so just make sure to choose one of these other options here. But for today, it's okay. I don't care about my practice problems or my practice project, so I can just get that uh, deleted later on. The next step is just to add some notes if you would like, optional, just to give you some information on what the project is for. I'm going to skip that for now. And then we get to choose what kind of project we want to use here. So we can either create the project from a blank slate, which we'll be doing today. We can choose to upload a REDCap project XML file. What this second option is great for is if you know someone either at your institution or another institution that has an existing REDCap project um, that you'd like to use, you can have them send over a file, you can upload it, and then start from where they left off uh, and then make some modifications from there. So you'd basically get a copy of the skeleton of their project. Uh, and the last option is to use a template. Um, there are a few pre-built templates at our institution, uh, and then you can choose from those templates if you want to start off with a form. But for today, we're just going to be using create an empty project, blank slate, and then from there, I'm going to scroll down and hit create project. Once again, this happens all from this new project button on the top tab here from my login screen. So I'll hit create, and that will bring us into our project itself. Now, before I jump around and talk about all these menu options, 
I want to talk about basic navigation. So let's say you've worked on your project for a little bit and you log out for the day and you want to come back and see your project again. Once it's fully created, you'll locate it again under the My Projects button here on the top. And uh, from the previous screen that we were on, there's also this button here on the top left that says My Projects. And from here, this is where all of your projects will live. So this is the one we just created, the Intro to RedCap Practice Forms. And if I ever need to return to that and come back in, I can select that. And I have two other projects here. As a conceptual, uh, a project could be considered an individual study. So maybe if you're on uh, three separate studies, uh, each of those studies will have you know, different data that they need to collect, and each one will have their own unique project. So you would click on the one whenever you log in that you're currently working on. Be like, okay, today I'm going to work on this one, and tomorrow I'm going to work on that one, or you know, whenever you need to work on them. So that's just kind of the idea to keep in mind when we're talking about projects. So here I am, let's say I log in the next day, and I'm going to find my intro to REDCap practice forms and continue where I left off. And that brings us right back to where we were. So I always like to take a moment and talk about basic navigation in REDCap. Um, and there's a lot of buttons that you're seeing on the screen right now. It's probably like you're in a spaceship. He's like, whoa, <laughs> what do I click? Which one makes it go? Which one makes it build forms? What do I do? How do I add data? What am I even doing? I'm going to go take a coffee break. This is too much. <laughs> uh, that's OK. We're going to go over uh, quite a few of the buttons here. Um, a few of the ones that I'm going to specifically focus on for this course is going to be the designer. Uh, here on the top left, as well as the project setup button and our add edit records and the menu where we were before to view everything under our record status dashboard. Um, so we'll be working with all of those today. Uh, REDCap, in terms of navigation, reads from left to right kind of like a book. So this left hand side menu that you see here is going to be very uh, consistent. So it's really not going to change that much. But depending on where you are on the left hand side, the right hand side is going to change. So for example, if I go to my add edit records menu on the left hand side, we see everything here change. If I go to my project setup menu, we also see things here change as well. And every one of these menus may or may not have separate tabs as well. So I'm in the project setup and I can go to other functionality. I can go back to project setup. Um, and let's say I go to a different menu, maybe the uh, dictionary here. We can see that I get a few more tabs on the top um, that say codebook and things like that. So depending on where you are, everything on the right is going to change. So over time, it will take a little bit of time to get that navigation down. But just remember to always start on the left hand side, because no matter where you are, this left Left side menu is always going to be consistent. Um, it may gain menu options over time, but you're really not going to lose anything from here. So that's a great place, and that's where I always go to navigate. All right, so that's a little bit of basic navigation. Um, I wanted to jump in now to building forms because uh, you know if you're doing data collection, the first thing that you're probably going to need is a form to collect some data in. Uh, so similar to our sample project here that we started, uh, we showed at the beginning, we have these six forms, and I'm going to create one right now called Patient Information, and we'll probably follow the same kind of format where we have uh, like a demographics form just to collect some basic patient information, and then we'll jump over to uh, maybe like a, a patient visit where they come in and see a physician. And then we'll just end it with a one week follow up that will just ask the patients, you know, how did you like the visit? How was your, you know, the greatest one to five, something very straightforward like that. So let's jump in. Um, so to make a form from scratch, uh, we would go to this designer here on the left hand side. Uh, it's also called the online designer, uh, but they do have this shortcut now just called the designer. And that's where you'll design your forms. Um, so I'll click on that button. And we're brought here. Um, so the instruments, <laughs> REDCap likes to call them instruments. Um, they are forms in my brain. Uh, instruments to me typically means like pianos and violins and trumpets and things like that. Uh, but REDCap likes to call them instruments. I like to call them forms. So if I ever you interchange those two, uh, instrument always means form to me and form always means instrument. They're kind of interchangeable there. And so in this list, REDCap will start you off with uh, one basic form, uh, either called My First Instrument, Form 1, depending on whatever version you're on. Um, and it always starts you off with one to begin with, so you have something to work with. 
And this is where you can create multiple forms. Uh, and each form you can think of as like a specific packet of paper or a specific kind of you know event that you want to collect information for a patient. You can think of it like, a, here's a demographics form and then, hey, give me your medication history. Um, and then maybe like, give me your uh, diagnosis history. You could have three forms for that. Or if you wanted to combine them all together into a single form, just called patient information, you could do that too. It's just however you wish to organize it. Um, in our case here, we're going to be doing uh, a couple of them just to kind of show what that looks like. Uh, so my first form here, I want to rename that. Uh, and I'm going to come over here where it says choose action. I'm going to rename that. So I'll click rename uh, from my drop down here. And we will call that, uh, let's call it patient information, just like that. And right now this is still blank, but I want to create a second form because I'll know I'll have at least two uh, in my project. And I'm going to click the create button on top here. And that's going to give me a spot on where I want to add my new instrument or form. And I'll select that and I will call this one um, office visit. How about that? So we'll just have some information in there for their office visit. So now I have two forms. Right now they're blank. Um, Technically, the first one has one field in there. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, but you can see the second one we just created has no questions in there. It is fully blank uh, right now. But uh, let's jump into one. So I'm going to click on the patient information uh, text here. And that's going to bring me into that form so I can add questions into that form. So this is showing us an overview of uh, the different ones that we have. And now we want to go into one and make some questions for it. So I'll select that and in we go. All right. And once again, for navigational purposes, uh, we got here via the designer menu on the left hand side, and I've selected my form that I want to add some questions to. Now, right, right now, there's one question already in here called record ID. Uh, record ID is an absolute requirement for REDCap. Uh, every project has a form called Record ID, although you can rename it. Uh, by default, you get this thing called Record ID. And you can see in our sample as well, uh, Record ID is kind of the definition or the number of the patient or the number of the record that always gets populated. Um, in a medical environment, Record ID would be very similar to an MRN. Uh, every patient needs to have their own MRN. And in this case here, uh, REDCap requires that every patient have some kind of Record ID or some kind of identifying um, you know, section that differentiates each patient from each other or each record from each other. And that's what this record ID field is for. So um, now that that's out of the way, let's talk about adding questions in. So to add a question, I want to go to this blue button that says add field. And I'll select that. Now from here, uh, it's going to ask us what kind of field type are you interested in? Uh, now field type is basically the kind of the kind of data that you're interested in collecting. So do I want to collect some kind of short text? Do I want to collect a multiple choice question where they have to choose A, B, C, or D? Do I want to do some kind of calculation here where uh, I want to make maybe a BMI automatically calculate? Uh, do I want to collect a signature at this particular point? So uh, as our example was before, so we have our first project here, uh, our first sample form here, uh, we have a few different types of collections. We have kind of short text here where people can type in their name. We also have multiple choice questions here where they would choose male or female. Um, and then we also have uh, like other types here, like a signature where uh, they're going to be adding in a signature. And we have a field type here that's just a descriptive text field where uh, they're not actually adding any information or not giving us any information. We are providing information uh, to the participant. But you can see how there's like these very faint lines lines uh, between each of these little guys here. And each one of those is going to be a, a separate question. So even though this one's kind of isolated on its own with its own little line there, um, this kind of field type is not going to collect any information uh, just for this one here. But that's what we're doing when we're choosing our field type. We're basically telling REDCap, this is the kind of data I'm interested in collecting for this question. Uh, and let's start here with something very simple, like in our sample. Let's do a, a, a first name and last name. Um, so for those, I'm going to choose a text box because I do see here it says short text. And I'm like, that sounds like a name. I can fit my name into a short text. Uh, let's do that. So I will select that and we'll get this nice big menu of a bunch of different things coming up. Here's our next control panel. Um, but we'll be talking about it uh, and hopefully you'll feel pretty good about it. So now that I'm in here adding my question, I have all these menu options that have shown up. 
uh, the very first thing is the field label. And the field label is basically saying, what is the question going to say to the person viewing it? And it's just very straightforward like that. What do you want your question to say? This is exactly how it'll be viewed uh, by an end user or by a clinician, anything like that. So uh, I can change or I can add the question in here and we'll just call it, uh, we'll call it first name. And now the second most important thing here is the variable name. And the variable name is how REDCap differentiates this question from every other question in your project. And it's very useful for uh, reporting later on as well as calculations. Uh, we don't want to go too advanced for this course, but uh, every question needs to have a unique variable name. Um, and the reason why this is useful is that you might have more than one question that asks for a first name. So you might have a, uh, a patient's first name, you might have a physician's first name, you might have an emergency contact first name, you might have three emergency contacts to have first names and last names. Uh, but the variable name needs to be different for each one of those questions so REDCap knows uh, how to separate them and how to uh, make them distinct from each other. So in this case here, if we put a question called first name, I might make the variable uh, pat first name for patient's first name. And so even though the, on the form it just says first name, REDCap always knows that this particular question refers to the patient, um, or at least it's separated from everything else that might also have the same kind of question. Um, great. Also touching on the variable name, uh, variable names have to have these underscores instead of spaces. Uh, it's okay if you don't put the underscores in because if you click out, it's gonna automatically enter them in for you. Uh, and typically you don't want to make it too long um, either. You might get a warning. So Pat first name for their first visit at the office. So if I make that way too long, um, I'll get this alert here that says variables are typically recommended to be 26 characters in length or less. Uh, so that's just kind of what we're working with that there. I still want to make it a little bit human readable so I understand what that means if I need to reference it later on. So Pat first name makes sense. I wouldn't want something like PFN um, because I may forget what PFN stands for in the future. <laughs> so I'll just leave it like that as is. And those are the absolute essences, or the absolute essence of a question is the field label and the variable name. So uh, at that point, you can just save the question and then you'd be good. Uh, however, it is important though to know about the other items uh, that are available here. So I'll touch on these a little bit more as we go on. Um, just for the time being right now for this question, a few other items that are important are, is this question required? Yes or no. And does this question contain identifying information? Yes or no. Um, so in this case, yes, the first name, I would like that to be required. I would like all my participants to have a first name entered into their form. Uh, and the second one here is that, is this an identifier? Does this contain patient identifying information, name, social security number, address, dates, things like that. Uh, in this case, it does. Yes, someone's going to be expected to put their identifiers in there. Um, the reason why this one's important and why it's in red uh, is that it's very helpful later on down the road to mark these uh, in case you ever need to de-identify your data. As long as everything is properly marked here as being identifiers, you can then easily strip out those identifying pieces of information and you have a de-identified data set that you could use uh, later on down the line. So that's why that's super great. Um, we'll talk about custom alignment and field note a little bit later, uh, but we just want to start with these guys here. So we talked about the field label, which is the question the patient's going to see, the variable name, which helps REDCap differentiate all the questions in your project from each other. Each question has to have a unique variable name distinct from everything else. Um, is the question required? Yes or no. And is it containing identifying information? Um, so I'll hit save, and that's going to add the question to the form just like that there, there's our first name. Great, so now I'm gonna repeat this process a couple of times just to kind of give you some familiarity with how the form goes. Um, so I'll hit add field again, and let's do the same thing. So by default, uh, it remembers the last kind of field type that I was working with, but just to start from scratch again, I would select the kind of field that I wanna add in there, so my text box. Uh, and then for the field label, this time I wanna say last name. And to keep it consistent, I will call it pat last name. And then, uh, is it required? Yes. Is an identifier? Yes, it is. Perfect. And I'll hit save, and then that will add my second question in there. So far, so good, right? Uh, not bad. 
Uh, let's add a couple of more. You'll see as we add in questions, more of these add field buttons are going to pop up. And this is just saying, where do you want to add your next field? Do you want to add it on top, in the middle, at the bottom? And those will just always appear there so you have that control over where you put your next questions. So I'll click add field again. And this time, let's do a date of birth. So uh, once again, choose my field type. Um, there's the text box here, but which uh, as, as I'm looking down, I also see that it is capable of collecting a date and time, which for a birthday sounds quite perfect if you ask me. Uh, so I'll select that text box. And for the field label, uh, let's call it uh, birth date. And for the variable name, we'll call it uh, Pat DOB for date of birth. And now we uh, come to this next section here that says validation. And validation is really good. Uh, we want to use validation as often as possible. You won't be able to use it very often, but whenever you can, it's a great thing to use to keep your data clean. Um, and validation forces end users to put in data in a certain kind of format. So you know, the great benefit of this is that later on down the road, uh, when you're doing analysis, everyone's date is entered the, the same way. So you don't have to be like, you know, people who type out the word January, or, um, you know, they might do year first instead of uh, the month first or something like that. In this way, all dates are collected in the same exact format, and it's uh, really relieves headaches later on. So validation, uh, I have a lot of different choices to pick from here. Uh, in this case, I'm interested in just getting the date uh, in this month, day, year format. So I'll select that month, day, year. I can choose to put additional restrictions with a minimum and maximum uh, on the validation, but I'm not gonna add those here. Uh, for the birth date, I'm also interested in making that required and an identifier. So I'll say yes to both of those and then hit save. And now you'll see that when once we did the validation for this specific kind, any kind of date validation, it's going to change what the answer box looks like for the question. Uh, it's gonna change it from being that free text where you can type whatever you want to being a date kind of picker uh, format. So you can see we got a smaller box here, even though it's the same kind of field, the text box as we did before, uh, the validation is what makes it this smaller box uh, where you can pick dates and things like that. Um, if you saw there real quick too, uh, that you can always go back and edit your questions by clicking on the pencil button next to it. So if I need to change a name or something like that, I can come back in and make those adjustments. And if I wanted to make it say patient last name instead, I can come in there and hit save and that will update my question. And we can do the same thing for the first one here. So patient first name and I'll hit save. So now let's switch it up a little bit. Uh, let's add another question. Uh, we'll make it a multiple choice question. So that would be something similar to here and actually state of residence sounds really good. Let's go with that. So I'll add another question, click add field. And this time from the top from the field types, um, instead of doing a text box, because uh, I don't want people just to type in whatever they want, I wanna do a multiple choice question. So I have a few options here, either a drop down list or a radio button. Uh, a radio button is similar to what you see here where you would choose from a selection of options and a drop down menu where everything will be hidden, kind of like this field type here. Uh, and when I click on the drop down, it opens it up and then you see all the options there. So that's kind of a good example of a drop down right here. Um, so I'd pick between those two. Uh, there's also this third option that says check boxes, and check boxes are used in the case where you might have multiple answers uh, for a question. So in the case where someone's like, please select all of the, um, let's say, uh, select any kind of uh, condition you may have from a list, and you might want to list like 10 conditions, they can check off more than one if they need to uh, for a question like that. Uh, but for this question right here, we're just going to do radio buttons because we're going to have people type in, or uh, enter, not type in, but uh, select their state of residence. Um, so we have radio buttons there, and we'll say state of residence. And for the variable name, we'll call it uh, Pat's state. Very straightforward. And now you get to just um, make your choices for your multiple choice questions. Uh, so similar to any multiple choice qu test, uh, every choice kind of needs a uh, code associated with it. So if you recall in those multiple choice questions, everything was A is this, B is option this, C is option that, D is option this. Um, all that good stuff there. So uh, when making these choices, you need to have a code associated with it. Um, typically, I like to use numbers as those codes, like instead of A, B, and C, and D, I like to use one, two, three, or four, because those numbers give me a wider variety of options later on. So if I do have a question that's maybe a, has a hundred choices, I don't run out of letters. Um, so that's typically what I like to do. 
And the way you can put those choices is by doing uh, the code and then a comma and then typing in the actual uh, choice itself. So California as a choice, we'll do two as Oregon and we'll do three as Washington. And one good thing to note too is that your order of choices and the numbers you choose or the numbers and letters you choose does not need to be in any specific order. Because um, I typically like to add in an option for other. Uh, and I like to make my other stand out from everything else. So I would typically do like a 99 as an other, or I can do an XX as an other. And the reason why is that as I go on later down the road, I can then just come back and add in uh, a number four or a number five if I need to expand my list. And I never need to move other or renumber anything. At all costs, you wanna try to uh, never renumber anything in REDCap as it can cause accidental data corruption uh, and it can get messy if you renumber things. Uh, so try your best to try and never renumber anything. Um, if you do for some reason absolutely need to renumber something, I'd recommend talking to your REDCap administrator uh, at your institution first. So in this case here, I'm gonna leave uh, other as XX, uh, just so we have that variety there. And we have California, Oregon, and Washington as our other states. And I'll hit save. So, so far we've added in a couple of questions. Not too bad, right? Um, great. So from here, I think what I wanna do next is uh, add some questions to my second form that was uh, for the office visit. So uh, let me go back to our designer. And this is where we are right now, but we need to go uh, a few levels up. So I'm gonna start from the beginning though and just go to my designer. And in here, once again, I have my two forms that I've created. And you can see I've been working on this first one here. It currently has five fields. We've just added those in. And for my office visit though, I still haven't added anything into that form. So I wanna add some questions in there. So I'll click on that office visit form. So I've selected it and now here we are. No questions are in there right now and I wanna add a couple of them in. So I'm gonna click add field and I'm just gonna go through the same process we did. So uh, I'm gonna do a text box and I'm gonna create a question that just says date of visit and we'll call it uh, visit date as the variable name. And as we did our validations before, whenever we're collecting a date, I like to validate it to make sure that all the dates come in in the same kind of format. And let's say that is required. Um, and it, actually in some cases, this actually may be an, an, an identifier as well. So I'll mark it as an identifier. Perfect, there's our date of visit. And now I wanna add in a different kind of field. So uh, we were working with text box before, and I wanna add in a question that um, allows people to type in what is the reason for the visit, or at least for the physician when they're seeing the patient, they can you know, uh, collect that information. Uh, and I wanna give them a bigger space to add in that info. So I'm gonna, instead of using a small text box where it says short text, I'm gonna use this notes box here that gives me paragraph text. So it's gonna be a bigger field uh, that, where they can type in more information. Um, you'll see what I mean in just a moment. So for the paragraph text uh, notes box, I'm gonna say that this is gonna be, um, let's say primary reason for visit as the question. And for my variable name, I'll call that uh, reason for visit. Perfect. Uh, is this required? I'm gonna say no. If they don't wanna add that in, that's fine. Does it contain identifying information? Maybe if it's typed in, uh, but I'm not gonna mark it as yes for that. I'm just gonna leave it as no right now, assuming that they will not type in the patient's name into the reason for visit, uh, which actually may occur. But there's ways around that uh, when you export data later on. But here we are, here's our primary reason for visit. And let's just do uh, two more things. We'll maybe collect some vitals on that. So I'm gonna come back here, add a new question, do a text box, and let's take a heart rate. We'll call it heart rate. And uh, once again, for validation, I expect only numbers to be in there. So I'm just gonna validate it as a number. So only numbers can be entered. And let's do one more question here and we will call it, um, let's just do a blood pressure. Perfect. And we'll call it BP for blood pressure. Actually, I'm gonna spell out the whole thing. Uh, acronyms are not my favorite. I do not like acronyms. Uh, you never know when someone might have BP as uh, the British Petroleum Company in their head. So uh, I like to spell it out. Makes it a little easier, at least for me. 
Uh, in this case, for validation though, because blood pressures may have that slash for the systolic and diastolic pressures, um, that wouldn't be considered a number. Uh, so I'm not gonna force a number in there. I'm gonna leave it as no validation and they can put whatever they would like in any format they want for the blood pressure. Some groups will actually split them out into two readings, so a place for systolic and a place for diastolic readings, uh, and then they will validate both of those as numbers. But in this case here, I'm just going to leave it combined and not worry about it. Perfect. So now we have our office visit. So now we have two forms uh, created, very basic, but you can see there that it's once you get started, it's not too bad to add in those questions. And I think we mentioned uh, later on that, um, or in the beginning, that we were going to create a third form that was uh, just a review on, you know, how did you like your office visit? So let me create that real quick. Uh, just hit create here again. Uh, and it's going to add a brand new form. We'll add it at the bottom and just say uh, rate your visit, something like that. Perfect. So rate your visit. And let's just do uh, this one here and we'll we'll make it a multiple choice question that just says uh, please rate your visit on a scale of one to five and the choices will do five four three two one and we'll call it five five four four three three two two and one one because red cap needs those codes rate uh, rate your visit perfect and one last one that just says optional comments. Comment on your visit. I'm using that paragraph text because I want that wider box. Rate your visit and we'll call it comments. So you can see that paragraph uh, box here does give you a lot more space to work with um, instead of the uh, small form or the short text box there. All right. So we have five forms. Uh, let's see where we're at with our uh, questions here. So we have red cap. Uh, what is red cap? So we talked about that. Show me what it does. Showed you uh, here on our sample of it collecting data. So uh, it's, yep, there we got, that's what we got there. How do I make a survey myself? Uh, we talked about that by uh, going into your project, creating one from scratch, going into the designer, adding in some questions there. Uh, how do I use branching logic? Number four, branching logic. Ooh, what is that? Um, so before we created a question uh, that said, you know, what's the state of residence? This is in the previous sample we were looking at. And it has those states in there. And it also has this box for other. So branching logic is one of the really cool tools in REDCap that allows you to make dynamic forms. Uh, dynamic forms meaning they change uh, as you go, depending on what someone selects. So for a state of residence here, if someone chooses California, Oregon, Washington, nothing happens. But if they choose other, a new box shows up that says other selected. Please tell me what you mean. What state do you live in? Um, and you can see how when you're choosing that, they will appear and disappear uh, based on that branching logic. So this is what branching logic does, that it hides and shows questions um, to make your form dynamic. And you can make these as big or as small as you want it to be. Um, maybe if someone uh, chooses female as sex, you may want to ask them about any pregnancy history. Uh, and you can open up uh, your form to ask you know, 15 more questions just based on that one selection itself. Um, or you can just add two or three, maybe, um, other things may come up. You have, uh, have you seen other physicians? And if they say uh, yes, you can open up uh, five places for them to put in five names of different physicians that they've seen. Um, so you can be very creative with branching logic and make your forms uh, be really dynamic to meet your needs and make it as you know, fluid for patients as possible. But let's show how that works. How do you make uh, these kind of branching logic items? So we have our patient information form here uh, that we were working with on our project and we've created similar questions. So first name, last name, birthday, and here's our state of residence. So we have California, Oregon, Washington, and other. So we wanna make a space uh, for other to show up another, to, for another question to show up if that's selected. So to start off, I first need to make that question on my form so there's a place for that data to live. So I'll add a new question in there, choose my field type, short text sounds good just for the name of a state, and we'll say uh, other selected, please specify state, something like that. And we'll do, we'll call the variable name state other. Perfect. Is it required? No, identifier, um, nope, not for a state. We'll hit save. And so other is selected, please specify state. 
So now we want to use branching logic to tell this question when it should and shouldn't show up. So I'm going to use a branching logic to give instructions to this specific question, telling it you should show up when this happens, and basically only when other is selected here. So I'm going to add the instructions here and give it those uh, instructions using this two-way arrow called branching logic, the green arrow. So I can select that two-way arrow, and I'm brought here where it says add and edit branching logic. And there's two options. There's the advanced branching logic syntax, uh, which I'm not going to go over in this course. Uh, this is meant, you know, just purely, purely for beginners. And I'm going to use the drag and drop logic builder instead. Uh, the drag and drop logic builder is going to meet 95% of your needs uh, almost every time you can use it and not have to worry about it. And so here you're going to take what condition you want to use and drag it over to the right. So this question should only show up when this condition is met. And so I'm looking here at my questions and I see the one that says Pat state and there's the other option. Option. And I'm interested in that this question should only show up when someone has selected other. So I can just drag that option, click and drag it over to the right. And just like that, I've added branching logic to my question. So this field will only show up when someone has selected path state of other. And I'll hit save on that. And now here's our branching logic. You can see that it's showing up on the question here in red. So that's an example of branching logic. Um, you know, if, if you need more practice on that, you know, feel free to rewind the recording and take a look at that again and see what's going on. <laughs> rewind. When was the last time I rewinded anything, huh? Jeez. VHSs. Long time ago. <laughs> All right. Um, let's move on to the next topic here of... Let's see what our chart says. Let's see what we're talking about here. So we talked about branching logic. Great. Now, last step we're talking about today is how do you enter data? Uh, so we're not going to be talking about entering data as surveys today. We're only going to be talking about, at least not for this course, we're only going to be talking about how to enter data as a clinician. Uh, so let's say you know uh, that you're going to be entering data on behalf of the patient or entering records into the system. That's what we'll be focusing on today. Uh, you entering the data and not the patient entering data. So the way that works is by coming to your menu here and we have our add edit records button on the left hand side. So I can select that add edit records button and this is where we would add edit records. You got it. <laughs> uh, and we have this green button here that says add a new record. So I'll select that. And here we are. Uh, it brings us to a new record for patient number one. And I have my three forms in there that I've created. So patient information, my office visit, and the rating of the visit. So let's say we just want to enter in some patient information to be, uh, uh, to be entered for the patient. And I'll select that button here. And now I can just type in uh, some sample information. So we'll call it uh, sample patient. And let's say they had a birthday from 1981 on the 8th. And let's say they live in Oregon. Perfect. And then is this completed? Once again, this status here only controls what the color of that little dot is going to be. Like for our samples here, you can see um, all the different dot colors that we have, and that's all this is gonna do. So if it's incomplete, it's gonna be red, unverified is yellow, complete is gonna be green, and it has no other bearing on your data whatsoever just besides that color. Um, so don't stress too hard on that. So I'll mark this as complete, and then hit save and exit there. Um, let's say we add in a little bit more information or let's add in another patient. So once again, I can go to my add edit records and I'll add in my second patient by clicking the green button. And once again, we fill out this form, the patient information. So we'll call it um, patient sneaky, sneaky patient, <laughs> sneaky patient. You don't want too many of those in the hospital, but you never know. Um, <laughs> just sneaking around the cafeteria, grabbing an extra <laughs> carton of milk or something. <laughs> oh boy, it's a little bit late here, sorry. And we'll say they're from Washington and then we'll mark this record as complete. Save and exit, perfect. Okay, and let's add in maybe a third patient in there as well. So I'll go into my add edit records and add in one more patient and this time uh, we won't have a sneaky patient, but we'll have a sleepy patient. Alrighty, and sleepy patient, uh, let's say they're from 93 on the 9th, and let's say they're from California. 
mark that as complete, save and exit. So just like that, I've entered in three records. If I wanted to continue, I could now continue to my other forms. Let's do it for patient number three here. Let's say a sleepy patient came in and they also came in for their office visit as well. I can click on that form right from here. And let's say they came in today. Uh, let's say that they came in because they're sleepy. Uh, they had a heart rate of 75 and let's do a blood pressure of 120 over 80. All righty. Let's mark that as complete and we can save that data for that second form. So that's add edit records. Um, that's how you add in data just through that process here. And now to bring it full circle and show you exactly where we were before with our sample project, we can return to our record status dashboard. And this is where all of our data records are stored. So similar to what we were looking at before, you can see that our project is a little bit smaller uh, than what we had here. We only have three forms in our sample instead of the six forms for this one. But you can see how it's kind of building. And as you add more forms, uh, this will grow and grow and grow. Um, and you'll be able to add more patients, one, two, three, four, five, as they go down the list. Uh, I love the record status dashboard just because this visual view, so you can see what needs to be done, what is already done, but it also has an add edit record or add new record button right from the dashboard as well. So if I wanted to add in more patients, I can just go from here. I can even skip the add edit records altogether and go from this dashboard. So same thing by clicking that green button, get into now patient number four and add in that uh, record. Uh, then we have our strong patient today. Perfect. He's uh, making his way in, bumping everything out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> and they're from Oregon. Let's say it's complete. And then actually let's change up the color. Let's say uh, it's incomplete. Let's say we're not sure that they're from Oregon. Maybe uh, we think we heard that, but we need to confirm with the patient, something like that. We can, um, Mark it as uh, maybe unverified. We'll mark it as yellow, and just need to. We'll, then we know we need to come back and maybe review that again with the patient, just like that. So here is our yellow marker. Once again, no other effect, just besides that color for visual purposes. Great. So we've entered a bunch of data, and we've created the project. Uh, the last thing that you want to do for any project is move it to production mode. So you've seen so far what we've been doing uh, when we when we. When we've been building the project, our project has been in development mode, like you see here. Uh, when you've completed the project, you wanna move it over to production mode. And you wanna do this when you're ready to collect real data. Um, or if you've already started collecting a little bit and you notice that you're still in development mode, you then wanna move the project into production mode. Moving to production mode uh, gives you kind of an extra layer of security on your data. Um, and it's kind of like putting a lamination over your entire project. So in case you make any changes later on, um, it does give you extra protections against accident, accidental data loss. Um, when you're ready to move to production, you uh, go to the project setup menu here on the left hand side and you select project setup. And if you scroll to the very bottom of the project setup, there is this option here to move your project to production status. Um, and that's what you want to do. So when you've finished everything and you're like, yep, everything looks good. We've tested it. Everything seems to make sense. We want to move it to production. So you go there and select move project to production. It then gives you two choices here. Either if you've already collected real data, uh, you can then choose to keep all the data that you have so far, or if you just made test records and you wanna wipe them out, you can delete all that data and start from scratch when you're ready to go. Uh, in this case here, I'll just pretend, for example, we have real data and I'll hit keep, and then I'll move it to production status. Um, you may have to wait up to one business day for production status to be approved, uh, but once you're in production, then you're good to go. A few things change when you're in production, so you can't make changes immediately um, anymore to your project. And that's done for uh, two reasons, or at least for one major reason, that is to protect your project against um, accidental data loss due to changes. So for example, now that I'm in production, if I go to my designer, I have this big yellow box at the top that says your project is in production status. Um, you need, in order to make changes, you have to do it in draft mode. And I have this button here that says enter draft mode. Uh, without entering draft mode, uh, I can't access any of my forms. Um, so I can't click on these uh, until I move it to draft mode. So I do that, I'll move it to draft mode. And once I'm in draft mode, I can then make changes like I normally would. So I can go into any of my forms, make any adjustments that I need uh, as, you know, as usual. And then whenever the adjustments are completed, um, so let's say I go in here and just make an adjustment. We add a state, something like that. So maybe I'll add uh, number four as Arizona. 
and I'll make that adjustment. And once that's completed, I can then submit my changes for review on the top here. Um, we do this uh, just to make sure that we have a second set of eyes looking at all the changes that are happening for our production projects. Uh, and the reason why that happens is let's say someone goes through and accidentally deletes a question and the consequence of that would be wiping out all the data uh, for that question. If your project was in development mode, uh, that data loss would happen immediately. Uh, but because you're in production mode uh, and you have to submit all of your changes for review, those changes come to our desk and we review them uh, every day. Uh, and we get you know, 10, 20, 30 of them every day. So you know, don't be shy on making changes. They're uh, very simple for us to review. So uh, make your changes and submit them. Uh, we'll review them for you. If there's any particular thing that comes up, it's like, hey, you know, you could potentially lose data by uh, doing these changes, we'll reach out to you. And it's not an immediate no or anything. Uh, we'll just reach out to you and say, hey, we've noticed that some of the changes that you're looking for could result in data loss. Are you sure you want to go through with them? And we'll point them out for you. And if you're like, yep, that's exactly what we want to do. We don't need that data anymore. Then we'll wipe it out for you, no problem. But we always want to have that second set of eyes looking at it just to make sure that your project is secure and all your data is not going to be corrupted or anything like that. Um, but yeah, that's the uh, process of moving to production. Um, when you're ready to do real data collection, always move your project to production and you'll be good to go. Um, but thanks again. This has been the uh, intro to RedCap course. Hopefully that you, we hope that you, I hope that you enjoyed it and got something good out of it. And uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good one.